My father always told me when I broke something, <clears throat> I'd come up and say it broke. He'd hit me on the side of the face with the back of his hand so hard that I'd often fall over. And he'd say, no, it didn't break. If you hadn't touched it, it wouldn't have broken. You broke it. Same thing would apply with the chainsaw. He also suggested that I should become the tool I'm using. So if I'm using a chisel, I should be the chisel looking back at the idiot who is pounding me through the wood into a nail. <laughs> or become the chainsaw looking back at the idiot, not watching that the chain is going through the tree and hitting a rock on the other side, that kind of thing. And it has served me well to uh, become the tools that I'm using. And uh, it helps make the tools work much, uh, much better. So let's simulate now <clears throat> buying a chainsaw. Uh, looking for what kinds of things should we look for when we're about to buy a chainsaw. The first thing I always hear from folks is, what chainsaw should I buy? What's the best chainsaw? And my answer there is, uh, there is no best chainsaw. There is no best manufacturer. However, <clears throat> there is a good model. So when you go to a chainsaw dealer, <clears throat> ask him which saw has been in production for at least four years. And if that saw is uh, there, that's the one to buy because most chainsaws don't work out. They're always coming out with new things to entice the market. Consumer changes, you know, it's like cars. <clears throat> they come out with slight changes that don't amount to hill of beans, and that happens with chainsaws. So you look for the ones that have been in uh, production. A major change over the years that has happened, of course, is the uh, Harvard MBA has uh, taught large companies to destroy local communities. <laughs> So we have the big box stores who come into a town and uh, take pictures and make notes of everything that is sold in that town. And then they offer those same products for half the price until everybody in town is uh, bankrupt. So in chainsaws, this, was, this had quite a bad effect. The, uh, all of a sudden, the chainsaw dealers went out of business. And uh, now the big box stores sell the chainsaws. Before, the dealer sold the chainsaws, and he also maintained them, and he fixed them, knew all about them, and it was a wonderful relationship. Today, when you buy a chainsaw, you're finished. <laughs> if you bring it back to the box store, that nobody is going to even give you the time of day. So learning about chainsaws is certainly far more important today than it used to be. On the plus side, chainsaws are very simple tools, and you should be able to completely fix a chainsaw. It never really needs to go uh, back to a dealer. So the first thing is pick a saw that has been in production for a while. The other effect of the Harvard MBA and the big box stores is that many chainsaw manufacturers also went out of business. So the number of manufacturers today is a tiny, uh, tiny uh, number. And the reason that that's bad is that when you had many engineers <clears throat> and uh, mechanical engineers inventing ways of uh, accomplishing tasks, <clears throat> there was more chance of something brilliant coming up. When there are just one or two, then there's much less uh, innovation. So you're at the dealer, and your first thing you do is you pick up the chainsaw, and you find that it's really heavy. <laughs> so you need to decide, do I want a powerful chainsaw, <clears throat> or do I want one that's a lot lighter and less powerful. When I was uh, a kid doing all this work, <clears throat> I swung this thing around like it was just a toothpick. I had no problems with it whatsoever. Today, after five minutes of using <clears throat> this saw, I, I'm dangerous. All of my arms and legs are rubbery, and I know that I'm going to hurt myself, so I put it down. And <clears throat> you need to make that decision. Am I going to muscle up to a heavy chainsaw, or <clears throat> do I want something that I'm only going to use occasionally and go for a lighter one? A smaller, lighter chainsaw only means that you go more slowly through the wood. It does not mean that it won't, go, won't do the task. It just does it more slowly. Nothing wrong with a smaller, lighter chainsaw. Next, we <clears throat> start looking at putting it together. The uh, first thing that you're going to put into a chainsaw, of course, is the fuel. So <clears throat> you look at the fuel tank, take off the cap, <clears throat> and for some reason, all modern saws have the cap hooked to a chain that goes into the tank. So you take it off and pull it off and it immediately pops out of your hand and hits the side of the chainsaw. And when it hits the side of the chainsaw, all the sawdust that's in there falls into the cap. When you put it back on, all that sawdust goes into the fuel. <laughs> so we want to try to fish the uh, fuel line out of there and if your finger can't quite get it, <clears throat> try a wire. You might be able to hook it up there. There it is. <laughs> 
So the fuel line <coughs> has a very heavy filter on the end of it. And that filter <coughs> drops into the tank, and it's always in the bottom of the tank. So if you're holding the saw upside down, suddenly the top becomes the bottom. <coughs> and that filter drops there because that's where the fuel is. If you're holding it sideways, it drops to there. So the weight <coughs> puts the uh, <coughs> line sucking the fuel where the uh, fuel is. The pump that sucks that fuel into the carburetor is the tiniest little piece of ru rubber you ever saw. We'll look at it a little bit later. So it is important that that work. So you, why do you need to get to this filter? Well, because all the sawdust that keeps being dumped in there <coughs> eventually clogs the filter. So out there in Idaho, I learned that pretty quickly. <coughs> you just pull this uh, filter off and swish it around in uh, raw gasoline, or <coughs> uh, that's what I did back there today, apparently. According to California, it's a carcinogen, so you probably shouldn't do it. <clears throat> but uh, I have been swishing this thing in gasoline for 50 years. I'm still here. <laughs> so the ease of getting to the filter, <clears throat> number one. The fuel that goes into that filter is a different fuel because the piston <clears throat> and cylinder <clears throat> that is in the saw gets lubricated by the fuel. So gasoline drops onto here just before it gets exploded in front of the piston. And that gasoline has to have some kind of lubricant in it. This is a two-cycle engine. Back then, it was 25 to 1. We would have 25 parts gas <clears throat> to one part oil. And we used 30 weight oil and regular gas. Things have improved quite a bit in the past 50 years. <clears throat> so the metallurgy is better in the uh, pistons and cylinders. But the gasoline has actually deteriorated but the oil has gotten better. So today, uh, they're actually promoting 50 to 1 mixtures, 50 parts gasoline and one part oil. That strikes me as being really hard on the chainsaw. <laughs> That's very little oil going into the chainsaw. Now, chainsaws were very subject to environmentalists. I was actually an environmental lawyer for a number of years <clears throat> until it became a little too crazy. But one of the first targets were people with chainsaws, because chainsaws, of course, were cutting down trees, and environmentalists were tree huggers. So the fact that chainsaws smoked became a big deal. And so manufacturers had to cut down on the amount of oil so that they wouldn't smoke. <clears throat> and that's how we went from 25 to 1 to 50 to 1. I have problems with that a little bit, so I go 40 to 1. 50 to 1 works fairly well with these motors run on outboard motors in boats because water goes through those and cools them down. The only thing that cools these down is air. Now you know that there's an enormous difference between air cooling something down and water cooling something down. <laughs> if you dunk something hot in air, it doesn't cool down much. You dunk it in water, it cools down instantly. So uh, I would uh, advocate a 40 to 1 mixture <clears throat> where 50 to 1 uh, might be recommended for the wrong reasons. What has happened with gasoline, of course, is that uh, uh, <clears throat> some farmers took uh, a few congressmen to dinner one day and said, uh, <clears throat> we're not selling our corn fast enough, <laughs> so why don't we make alcohol and make all the people use alcohol in their gasoline? So today, all gasoline has ethanol in it. And what is the problem with that? Well, <clears throat> when my wife died, I started to drink gin at night. And uh, I would uh, pour the gin into the glass, and then I would put some ice cubes in there. And a half hour later, the ice cubes were gone. You couldn't see them at all. They were totally melted. <clears throat> there was no evidence that they were there. Well, what's, what's that all about? <laughs> How come the water disappeared? As a kid, I would put gasoline. My dad had me put gasoline in a glass jar. And <clears throat> any water that was in there was always at the bottom, because water and gasoline don't mix. So we would pour the gasoline into the chainsaw, but not that bubble of water that was in the bottom. Well, when you put alcohol in gasoline, of course, the water dissolves. So today, gasoline is full of water. And water is extremely detrimental <coughs> to engines. So uh, <coughs> what you want to do is always use gasoline that's absolutely fresh. You get it right out of that gas station and mix the smallest amount of fuel that you need. I mix a gallon, typically. Uh, and even that, I found I don't use enough. So uh, I should be doing a quart, just enough for that day's use if I'm not going to use it again for another month. So you don't want gasoline sitting in your garage somewhere for 
weeks and then make gasoline for your chainsaw because that will be full of water and will <clears throat> damage the chainsaw, even wreck it. Or uh, the best scenario, it won't start. <laughs> if there's a lot of water dissolved in the gasoline, the chainsaw won't work at all. And manufacturers tell you that. When you buy your chainsaw, the first thing they'll say is a good big paragraph about how not to use old fuel and not to leave fuel in the uh, tank. This has become such a problem that uh, people are, uh, w there is now available a special mixture of fuel that is being sold at an unbelievably high price. You can buy these at Walmart, places like that. This has, in addition, uh, chemicals in it that uh, uh, counter the ethanol and that also prevent algae from growing. There are all kinds of animals that actually grow in oil and, uh, and devour oil <clears throat> and over time they get settled uh, in big colonies in your fuel tank. It's especially a big problem in boats and more prone in uh, diesel engines but it also happens in ethanol gas. So, make long story short, <clears throat> either buy fresh fuel or get these cans that have those chemicals, stabilizers, and so on uh, in them. So, we have gasoline <clears throat> that's going with oil in it that's going to go into the engine, <clears throat> and that gasoline is uh, <clears throat> going to be exploded with the other thing that we need is air. So, the chainsaw is cutting all this sawdust and throwing it into the air like mad and of course sucking it into the engine to make the engine work. Well, if we had the sawdust going in, <clears throat> it doesn't work well. So you ask the dealer to show you the air filter. You want to see how good that is. This, this saw was designed by somebody who really used chainsaws. I'm guessing that chainsaws that are being sold today are being designed by young mechanical engineers who have never used a, a chainsaw. And the pressure in mechanical engineering to make things cheap is dramatic. So <clears throat> these uh, products today are nowhere near as well built and rugged as they were years ago. So here this cover comes off, takes just uh, two seconds, and here is the filter. What's the first thing you notice about this filter? Well, it's huge. <clears throat> all the air hits this thing, all of the sawdust gets gathered, and nothing gets through into the carburetor. And because it's so big, you can use it for hours and hours before it's finally clogged. The filter on this chainsaw here, which is only a year old, is about the size of a quarter. <laughs> so it easily gets uh, clogged. <clears throat> really silly. This is the original filter on this thing. This saw is a 1960 model. <laughs> so that makes it, uh, <clears throat> how old? 60, 40, 60 years old. And it's still good. When uh, you take a chainsaw to a dealer, the few dealers that exist, they will always do a lot of things that don't need to be done. So automatically they'll replace the filter and they'll replace a bunch of other things there that don't need to be uh, replaced. In mechanical work, what is usually the problem is dirt. Whether it's a fuel injected high performance car or a chainsaw, it's usually that dirt got in there somewhere. With the gasoline, that has the water in it. The water <clears throat> combines with the metal parts of the carburetor and that forms rust. So that's an oxide of the metal. And oxides of metals are many, many times bigger than the metal was to begin with. So like uh, rust from iron, steel, is 22 times bigger than the steel was. That's why with those big bubbles that show up in your car pushing the paint off, that's because the steel rusted under the paint and it's growing, pushing the paint off. So imagine that happening in a carburetor. Well, it immediately clogs the carburetor. Fuel injectors on automobiles, same kind of thing. <clears throat> it's just the uh, moisture that causing the problem by oxidation. After we've determined that it's easy to get to the uh, air filter, we want to see how hard it is to get to the spark plug because the spark plug is often a reason for <clears throat> the uh, engine not starting. So let's say that you uh, have tried to uh, start this, uh, this engine and it doesn't start. The first thing you would check is whether there's gasoline in it. The second thing you would check, because it's easy, is uh, whether the air filter is clogged, but, but that's probably not the problem. But the spark plug is uh, 
uh, is a good candidate for not starting. So how easy is it to get the spark plug off? Well, on this chainsaw, the spark plug is right there on the outside, and it comes right off. On <clears throat> other chainsaws, you have to take four or five pieces off before you can get to it. And that's totally silly. It should be right out there. S somebody will tell you, oh, it's got to be waterproof. Does not at all have to be waterproof. The chainsaws work fine in pouring rain <clears throat> with the spark plug exposed to the rain. So what you do is you take the spark plug out and uh, look at it. And you'll find that there's a bunch of black gunk between the spark plug electrodes. <clears throat> so we have this electrode here, electrode here, and we want a spark to take place in between them. So the black gunk is there because, again, everything's your fault. Don't forget, <laughs> this is your fault that that black stuff is there. And it's there because the last time you used the chainsaw, you used it for five minutes and put it down. And the time before, you did the same thing. Well, in five minutes, the chainsaw doesn't get hot enough to burn the oil that's mixed in with the gas. So the gas explodes to make the engine run, but the oil starts to accumulate on the spark plug. And pretty soon there's so much of it there that there's no longer any spark. So you need to clean that off. In the old days with leaded fuel, a slightly different thing happened. <clears throat> a, uh, a very hard uh, mixture of lead and metal <clears throat> would form into this pebble between the two electrodes. So you'd have to pop uh, that off to get it running again. So to see whether the uh, spark plug is actually sparking, once you have it uh, cleaned out, you put it back on, and then you get your son-in-law to hold it for you for a minute. And then you pull on the starter. <clears throat> now, when you pull on the starter of a chainsaw, there is on the uh, fan, all chainsaws have a fan that suck air through the engine to cool it. And on that fan, there is a magnet. And <clears throat> right here in one position, there is a bunch of wires all coiled up. Anytime you take a magnet and whip it by a bunch of wires, it tricks electricity into flowing in the wires. It's uh, inducement, it induces a current. So <clears throat> with every turn, this thing makes one electrical shock out to the spark plug. So <clears throat> when he's holding it, or somebody else that you don't like holding it, you draw <clears throat> the cord and he should go, ah, 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 just like that. That's every time he gets a shock, he makes a sound. If he goes, ah, 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 then you know that it's not sparking every time. So you need to look at the spark plug again, and you'll find probably that the ceramic cone that's inside the spark plug holding the electrode in place is cracked. So some of the sparks are ta taking place deep inside the spark plug, and it's no good. So you replace the spark plug. If you are a little bit less sadistic than I am, you can simply take the spark plug and place it on a metal part of the chainsaw. Maybe scrape a little bit of paint off somewhere and hold it tight against it. And when you pull the cord, you should see every time the motor goes clunk, that means it's gone around once. Clunk, 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 clunk. You should see spark, 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 spark. And if, you do, <clears throat> if it misses once or twice, then you know the spark plug is not good and it won't uh, run. Hey there, thank you for watching. Here at Shelter Institute in Woolwich, Maine, we teach a wide variety of house building and timber framing and carving classes. We'd love to see you here, but if you can't make it to Maine to take one of our classes, our online class is available at shelterinstitute.com.